Well, thank you all for coming today. I appreciate the opportunity to present. I remember, you know, I, I, when Aaron first asked me, I was thinking about what has changed. And, and I remember back to a visit to a university in the Midwest, which will remain nameless for, because of what I'm going to say. Uh, but it, the university, the, one of the professors I met with in the math department I'm a mathematician by training, so it's a natural place for me to head. Uh, so I did. And I said, you know, I'm working on models of the brain, mathematical models of the brain. So, and that's what I like to do in my spare time. So that's, that's a fun thing to do. Try it sometime. It's, it is a good thing. Anyway, I worked on that. And, I, and of course, the, what I heard back from one of the, just one of the universities in the Midwest, <laughs> professors there, said, you can't actually do that. That's not, that's not possible. Now, I mean, Min Minsky and Pappert had already published their papers on neural, neural network, so I don't understand what happened there, but oh well. But what is, what is fascinating to me is here I am, you know, a number of years later, and I won't say how many, because <laughs> that will tell you too much about my age, and that's not relevant, uh, but rather that data and analytics is now core, right? It is, it is in everything that we're doing. It is, it is the growth industry. And I was looking around for some more recent things. And one of the, one, I came across this one. I was just talking to somebody from the World Economic Forum the other day. And we were talking about the new initiative they have for the, what they call the fourth industrial revolution. And you know, what we call at Gartner, we're calling you know, the, the digital business era or the digital society. And that is that the opportunity is enormous, and at the tr to the tune of around $100 trillion is what the World Economic Forum um, in indicates. In our own research at Gartner, and, and I work in the research part of Gartner where we dig into what's going on in the world and what kinds of changes are happening and how should we advise senior executives on their path and how do we advise universities, which we also do, and how do we advise government agencies around the world of all different stripes. So, and, and we see it as an opportunity that is just within IT. So think about business size, enormous, IT, small part of business, but important. And e even so, we're seeing that it's on to the tune of around $5 trillion. So, you know, pretty, like Everett Dirksen said years ago, so some who are old as me will remember, you know, a billion here, a billion there pretty soon. You yeah, have yeah, talking real money. So I guess a trillion here, that was inflation since then. So, you know, I'm pretty sure now it's a trillion here, a trillion there. But I think the point is really this, that, at the heart of all this stuff is connectedness, is understanding one another better, is having a digital persona as well as an, a human persona, and the two can be variable. And in fact, the two can be, a, you can have a multitude of such personas, and they all exist in the connectivity. That we, that we have, the digital connectivity. So what does that mean? That means we're sharing data. That means we're sharing ideas. That means we're sharing thoughts. We're sharing images. We're sharing sensor data, loads and loads and loads of sensor data over, over what's called the industrial, you know, the industrial internet, if it's from GE or IoT, the Internet of Things uh, is the way we refer to it. But nonetheless, the opportunity is immense. And I'm sure you're seeing these things and you've seen numbers. So, of course, there's billions of these. We know this. I think the important part is that when we, as we look forward in our own businesses, in how we, how we teach, how we, do, how we plan to do our research, is we have to think about this kind of problem. That is that there are winners and losers in every game. And those who adapt and change and grow, they'll win. Those who do not, they'll lose. And of course, a uh, long time ago when, when I worked at Ford Motor Company and I, learned, and I met uh, Edward Deming, uh, and he talked, about, he talked about the losses that are incurred for poor quality 
And one of the things that really affects, poor, that comes out with poor quality or with poor quality research or with not getting with the program and adapting and growing and helping is people lose their jobs. They lose their jobs, they lose their livelihood, they lose their houses, they can't support their family. It's a big deal. So we're, I'm gonna talk a bit about all of this stuff and I'm gonna talk about it in terms of the digital business, digital society, and there are other terms for it as I mentioned. Think about it as a set of things that have to do with new designs of how we operate as organizations, whether in business, whether in academia, whether in government, whether as a nonprofit. That there are, a, and, and there was a, a study, one of my chief scientists when I was at Visa did a study and I asked him once, how many patterns can we find in columnar data? And you know, he published a paper on it. It's in the ACM journal, it's dated a few years back. But he said it was something on the order of n factorial factorial, which is, you know, that's just factorial number of columns. So, you know, it's, a, it's an enormous number. It grows like this, and it's enormous. So what, what that says is that, all, of course, there are a lot of patterns that are going to be useful, just like there are connections in the brain that appear to be useful or, or codons in the DNA that appear to be useful and others that appear not to be useful or have, been, have served their purpose and are no longer useful. But nonetheless, it's a lot to sort out. <laughs> so, so we've got to think about where are we going with this stuff? How are we going to move move our organizations forward? How are we going to move our research forward? How are we going to move our studies forward? How are we going to understand and grow so that we can adapt to and be part of a, the digital society, part of the digital business world as, as we go into the next 10 years? And it's already happening. So, you know, one of the things that my, uh, one of my, one of my, the folks that works for me, Frank Boutendyke, talks about with the digital society is, you know, that, by the way, that's a little picture of a cat with a little picture of a mouse. And of course, there's some pathway through there. That's our expectation for the way we have to go. So same idea, but that is that it's not going to be a singular path. It's going to be the exploration of many, 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 many paths. So the when an opportunity is as large as the one we're faced with, not only will there be dislocations, but there will be opportunity to change and grow and, and deal with that in a way that will help us help everyone do the work that we need to do. So I want to, I want to next, so I'll talk about a few things in, in my talk that are related. So one is what are the characteristics of this, this phenomenon? That what are some of the risks associated with it? What are some of the findings we have? What, what do the dislocations really look like? Uh, how do we understand the value of things in, this, in the digital economy and the like? I can only touch on things. We, you know, we don't, we, we do have another three hours, right? <laughs> no, oh, maybe Erin said something like that, didn't you? No, maybe she didn't. Um, no, at least we'll, we'll go more quickly than that. But the point is, is that there's a lot we can talk about we want to encourage, at, at my organization, we spend time talking about these things. We want to encourage thinking. We want to encourage talk, discussion. We want to encourage growth. And that's really why I'm here. So what does business look like? So this is, I've spent all my time in commercial entities. So I really have done services for uh, public and private organizations, but I've basically spent all my time making money. So I'm very good at it. I know how to make money. <laughs> so one of the things that, that I think about when I think about how do I ensure that my business is thriving, because if my business is thriving, I can hire more people. If I can hire more people, they get good jobs. The economy grows. They come up with new ideas. They go off and start new things. So how can I, I need to then understand what are the components of that and where are the shifts? And you can see here on the, here's today, Right? There's a stack of traditional businesses. This is the kind of thing you know, that we know about, you know, medical services, finance, the fairly complex things. You know, frankly, research is, is one of them. Um, and educating is one of them. So there's, there's things we have to do 
that will, that will continue to do, and in fact, we need to grow. There are things that have to do with what, what are the platforms that are, that are coming up? Where do we go with those platforms? What does it mean to connect entire cities with one another, to connect the individuals or groups within that city to the city and then connect them elsewhere so that they have a seamless experience no matter where they are in the world. If they have a healthcare issue or they want to get something done with their business or they want to change, that they have those opportunities and they can do so quickly. The algorithmic business is a term we use for th those kinds of things that we'll, we can do purely with the algorithms that, that, we, that we create. So there, we do see an enormous amount of growth in algorithmic business from right around, it's right around 13% now to about 27% 20 by 20, 2030. And what do we mean by that? So right now you can, we can build and market you know, algorithms that we put, to which we attach APIs. We can put them on, you know, in different services that are available. Microsoft has some, Intel's publishing some, uh, Google has a source. There's a number of, of larger entities that have sources that you, where you, wherein we can publish and grow. There are a lot of small ones too, because it's a big opportunity. And they're fundamentally about how calculations that we do on, on data, right? So calculations for, on images, calculations on voice, calculations on music, calculations on sensor data. And, we, and all of those algorithms, some of which will be free, some of which will want to uh, give away and, oops, sorry, and the like, back up a little bit. Uh, I was going to point out. And then finally, there's, there's also other businesses that are unique and different that we will continue. And, you know, I've, last year, about, the, you know, not quite this time, but it was uh, about a month. So about 10 months ago, I had a conversation with the CEO and chairman of the board of of, the, of one of the largest yeah. automotives. So, you know, I can't tell you which one because that's proprietary, but, you know, so this is the chairman of the board of a huge um, conglomerate that builds automobiles and a whole bunch of other things and has worldwide operations. And he said to me, Joe, I need to know how to build a digital business. And, you know, it's like, well, gee, we have, an, you know, another hour. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's get started. Let's figure out where you're at today. What are you doing today? And what I found fascinating about that conversation was that one of the reasons I left Ford many years ago was it was boring, <laughs> right? It didn't move. And now here I am on the flip side of that, back to talking to automotive companies. To, and the chairman of the board of this enormous company is saying to me, how do I go about using data and analytics to drive my business forward? How do I create new sources of revenue? And I've heard that we've got another conversation. We have conversations like that now regularly. And so that means that there's investment going on in a very big way. That means there's opportunity. That means that there's, there's things we've got to go figure out and come up with answers to. And we really, you know, it, we need to do it as quickly as possible. So why are we doing it? So another one of our, our, our researchers, Hung Le Hong, he, he talks about this particular definition of how do you get to digital revenue. So think about you know, major physical assets. So you know, back to the automotive example, because I'm familiar with it. I know what it looks like from start to finish. Um, I was part of the Taurus project. So I'm very familiar with what it means to create a car from a concept all the way through to, to its delivery and then servicing. And it, that's an enormous amount of upfront investment. So you sink a lot of costs expecting and hoping you did it right, right? And it's, I remember Don Peterson when he came to talk to us, so you, another thing indicator for how old I am. But um, I remember when Don Peterson came to talk to all of the executives in a, in, at Ford, and in particular in the Research and Engineering Center, he said to us, if we don't get this right, we're sunk. You know, now there are other things that, have, that were going on with the entire automotive industry that needed to be cleaned up and fixed and fine. But the point was, his point was, we got to get this right. We have to, you know, because the bet was so enormous. Now com contrast that with the conversation I've been having with the same kinds of automotives today. And that's all, virtually all of them. So, you know, in the one I described to you, plus every others, is this, that I've got a small investment up front, and then I've got, I, I'm able to go sell this thing. 
If it doesn't work, out it goes. I can try again. So I can do, get going with far less capital investment. I can see results very fast. I can then set up recurring flows. I can do variations on the theme. I can then move easily across geographies because I'm talking about digitally connected things. And the net result is that I end up with far more, a higher velocity of turnover in my products. And, that, and of course, in the ability to create and drive new revenue sources very, very quickly at a very low cost. Yes. So in your opinion, does the self-driving car make the left thing more? I mean, it... yeah, good, good question. I'll get to that in just a second. So thanks. But that's a very good question because I'm going to talk about that. <laughs> so, anyway, so what are the so what are some of the things going on self-driving car one of the pieces of the puzzle is that's obvious so when i was talking to this chairman i said well you know self driving he said yeah of course we know that <laughs> we've we've already got that moving i want to talk to you about what comes after that so the piece of the puzzle is self-driving car what does that mean well we have to absorb all sorts of images we have to un have an understanding of a lamp post we have, you know, think about that. I want to take this down to what it really means when you got the bits, because I've actually tried this before. And you, you're trying to understand what the bits mean. And you've got to be able to adapt to that because you don't really want the car to drive into a lamppost. You want it to drive near the lamppost or while well, it's sitting on the curb, but not onto it. So, but how many other thousands and thousands of variations are there? So as we, as we absorb those images, we have to take them apart. We have to understand, I call it the isness or the, the vehicleness or the peopleness or the cat or the dog or the bicycle or the lamppost or the stop sign or whatever nests because it's going to be from every, which, every, every possible angle, every possible way of looking at things. And that's all a mad, matter of understanding how we, how we compress that information really quickly, respond to it, feed it into the system and go. So the, the key piece is that's just the start. The next piece has to do with, but there's also vehicles talking to each other, there's vehicles talking to uh, service stations, right? So you go into a service station, there's no reason you have to pull out a credit card, your vehicle can talk to it and ensure that you're paid. Or if you're, if you're charging it up and, and there's a fee for that, it can automatically tell when the thing starts to stop. But that's even, that's even simple. Beyond that is think about the environment of a vehicle. The environment of the vehicle, basically, especially you know, California traffic, which I'm sure we're all familiar with, you get to sit there a lot, right? So, so you're a captive audience. Think about that from a commercial perspective, which of course I do, which is, wow, I've got a captive audience. What can I do? And I want to own that own that. I don't want to give that away. So when, we're, when we look at those kinds of situations, we're, how can we monetize that? We can monetize it through providing entertainment services. We can monetize that by providing capabilities to, to drive to where you want to go, but to voice, voice capabilities to, in under, for the vehicle to understand what you need it to do. Um, the ability to just communicate with other vehicles so it knows what's around it, basically creating a swarm of vehicles. There's a, there is a large number of things we, we have to and need to do in order to grow that part of the economy. So just, just a few examples. Did I get to well, in, further? Yeah, I guess. I mean, my challenge is it seems like it's a clashing of paradigms. On the one hand, the digital paradigm says, you know, lean, startup, do... Yeah. Missions, pivot, whatever, but you're still talking about a 5,000 pound. Uh, Absolutely. Oh, yes, of course. Yeah, and, and, and the, the difficult part for established businesses, no matter which one we're, you're, you're in, if there's huge capital investment behind it, that, that actually has value. It's not, and hopefully it's not going to go away soon. You know, things change, but nonetheless. But more, more importantly, you want to think about it in terms of how else can I drive my revenue, right? So when I look at, when I look at a business like that, so capital intensive business, whether it's air, airplanes or it's uh, consumer product, product goods, or it's another thing that's gonna take a lot of capital investment, vehicles, airplanes, that I already mentioned, sorry, you know, logistics and all the rest, 
how do I actually make that work in what we, what we are calling, we call mode one, which is that stuff better work. Mode two, which is how do I experiment and grow new, new things? And we actually, as organizations growing, as you know, that want to stay in business, and they do, they want to be able to understand wh what kinds of things can I just play with and try in, in, my, in one part of the business while I keep going with the rest of the business. That's real, of course, you know, it's business school here, right? So <laughs> that's, that's a tricky thing to do. You got people who are set in their ways who know how to drive a particular thing in a particular direction and make it right. <clears throat> then you're saying to some of them, well, go figure out how to fail. It's not easy. So the, the bottom line with that, with that is it's all about people at the end of it. You know, we have to figure this out. We have to drive it forward. We have to do the things that we need to do. And, and you know, this is where I used to work. <clears throat> and, you know, when I left, it was boring. When I, get, when I come back and talk to them nowadays, it's exciting. <laughs> So, as you know, and and you can see that they're thinking about different, you know, modalities. That's just an example. Another example. So, you know, another area that was difficult as when I was flogging re, uh, analytics products. So I used to have an analytics company uh, back in the day when I was out there trying to sell that stuff and uh, talking to a retailer. Retailer would always tell me my margins are too thin. Go away. I don't have time for you. How does it help? You know, can I grow it immediately? The answer is no, we actually have to do it. Never mind, get out of here, Bogaisky. So, but now retailers are, do, are looking at the same kind of thing. I have this wealth of information from consumers. I have a wealth of information from my stores. I have a wealth of information from distributors. I want to understand how that information can help me do new things, create new products, build products, bespoke products for for folks, as, as in the case of what Burberry's doing. So e retailers are in the game. This one's probably a bit more obvious, but it's not, it's not an easy one to handle, right? So when we look at things that are locomotives, airplanes, things that spin a lot, you know, um, whether an MRI machine, there's a ton of data coming off these things, right? And so somehow, some way, we've got to figure out how to deal with that data make sure that we've dealt with it in ways that are consistent with what information needs to be acted upon immediately, what can wait a few seconds, what can wait a few hours, what can wait a few days, etc. <coughs> and it is that way, by the way. It's, uh, it's something in my own research I call time domains, but you know that is what kinds of information needs to be operated on by which kinds of algorithms that can go really fast and give a response that makes sure that thing stays up in the air. But then there are those that when the thing lands, what kinds of maintenance needs to, and that's, thing, that's stuff that's happening now. All of that is processing sensor data. All of it's processing data and using algorithms and using, using data and analytics to drive, to drive the whole thing. Hotels are in the act. This is one from a Japanese uh, company, and I think it's got a little bit blurry on the bottom. Uh, but you know, I don't want to stay there. One of our guys did told us about it, so it's, uh, it's a bit cramped for me, but um, I like some, ask Erin, she, she set up my hotel room so she knows I'm something a little bigger, but <laughs> yes. Um, can we take my colleague's question and uh, combine that with the car? <clears throat> I mean, maybe a car has got a nice sleeping uh, sure. mode, and it's one of the three standard models that we're sharing. If I'm in a hotel, wherever they are, yeah. why don't I want to buy uh, autonomous cars and say, uh, you know, you'll sleep in the car, you'll arrive at the airport there are, when you need it, and then we'll need less physical capital Yep. because we'll be more efficiently using the cars and we won't need this. You won't need to slide into that module. I, I couldn't agree more, I but <laughs> I couldn't agree more. But so what we see is right now, there are bus services that are doing, are, you know, that are automating the driving of the bus that exists today that provides sleeping care, care quarters. You know, because if they're going to go, if you're going to go across from one city to another, you can you can do that. So that's happening. There's some of that happening today. So you know, if you're going, to, because I know a lot of folks that when they're traveling, they prefer 
to be able to get, you know, instead of staying overnight at a hotel, just get on the plane and fly home, except it's not that comfortable. How about, you know, if you had just a, a one city to another, like from, from uh, well, I don't want to say from here to LA, because that's, a, well, yeah, sure, that, that works, because it takes forever. Um, yeah, you know, that's too far. <laughs> just getting up to my house in Santa Clara, I'd love that. But, you know, just sleep on the death or put the car into automated driving mode on I-5 and sleep in it. That sounds great. But yet, that's I think the point is that from my perspective is that all of these are things that we need to be looked at, tried out, experimented with, see where it goes. And indeed, that's happening today. If you, you know, for a lot of ideas, we're finding that these, everywhere we look, my point of this whole part is that everywhere we look, whether it's oil and gas, smart fields, organizations like Shell have figured out how to drive better productivity out of their existing wells instead of drilling new ones by doing better with the sensor data that tells them what's happening in the pipelines, to the refinery, to the, to the distribution centers. And that, that, that there's also an entire set of government activities that are happening. You know, that whether or not it's, it's London Transport with an AP, that's actually an API provider to other parts of the organization. Or city, the Toronto is at doing more with their, with their work. U.S. Ser services, the U.K. government with their services. All over the world, I know in Thailand, in Australia, in China, in all, the, all throughout Asia, in parts of Africa, and, and growing. Digital things are, being, are happening. Why? Because the investment's low, the opportunity, you know, the returns are high, and there's an opportunity to grow. And moreover, there's an opportunity to be more responsive to citizens. If we're more responsive to citizens, we get better, they get reelected quicker. So what are the components then of, the, of what this means? So we think, we think about it at Gartner as a you know, data and analytics platform. So there's a business platform, and then there's the actual you know, technology platform. So the business platform uses things like advanced analytics, business intelligence to understand what's going on, to focus on things such as connected devices, to operate the business in more efficient ways, whether it's IT systems uh, or the like, that we're looking at ways to do better customer analysis, better services for our clients, as well as partnering, partner supplying and the like. When we look at the components of the technology, all of these are pieces of the puzzle. The information systems platform, we know how to build those. They exist, they're changing, they're growing, they're doing better, but we're, you know, they're still, that's kind of known, known stuff. Customer experience platform, we get that. We know that we have to pay more attention to, from the technologist's point of view, well, how is our technology being used? What are we doing with it? How are we servicing it? And the like. The IoT platform, we're connecting devices. What does that mean? How does it grow? An ecosystems platform refers to the ability to, con to provide these services to one another whether it's in an open source fashion or it's, or it's, a, you know, an entire, it's an ecosystem of capabilities such as supply chain provides or the like. And at the center of all that, of course, is data and analytics. So, you know, which comprises things like partner and supplier analytics, business and operational analytics, algorithmic analytics, IoT analytics, customer, that's a lot of analytics. It's also a lot of data. So this is the whole, so a few years back, this was called big data. Then it was called, you know, uh, what was it something after that? <laughs> oh, I know, AI is now. There's a whole bunch of people talking about AI. Um, AI just, is, can't think of it as a placeholder, it means the same thing as big data. It's just kind of the latest type, but it does mean things like machine learning, the capability to understand and feedback qu quickly uh, and your analytics, it's the same analytics, it's not new. It's analytics we understand, we know about the simplest form is linear regression, more complex forms are like deep neural networks. You know, there's a lot to be done there and that, that, needs, to, that needs to happen. So, and I've talked about, we can talk about it in terms too of what does it mean on an individual basis? And this, I mentioned the customer experience, that's this example. Customer experiences, I can understand what my blood pressure is now, if my Fitbit weren't broken. Um, 
that I could actually talk, and of course we can do that today, talk to the doctor, but more, more importantly, we want the doctor to be able to share information with colleagues, to understand what's happening, to know what's going on with the individual and with the populations that, that are around them. So how does it look in the wild out there right now? <laughs> so we, do, we regularly do surveys and say, okay, who's doing what and what are they getting done and the like? So when, when we ask, so we ask CEOs uh, around the world, well, what are you, you know, what are the things that are going to really help you drive change? Advanced analytics is number one. Uh, that's, and that's true whether or not it's APAC or it's anywhere else in the world. So the global figure is 81% APAC, uh, meaning Asia Pacific. So it's across the, um, Asia, uh, the Pacific Rim uh, countries there, all the way into, all the way to India and over, et cetera. So machine learning, virtual assistants, you know, the Internet of Things, they're going to 48 percent of the investment going to that as well as 54 percent. So more in APAC. Why? Because there's more manufacturing. There's more plants and, and things like that to worry to, to get done. Uh, digital security, unfortunately, doesn't look this. I find disturbing. Um, it's something that we talk to clients about regularly in every in every industry. It's like, let's not forget because you got to secure this stuff. Um, as well as then, of course, the algor business algorithms of different kinds. How do we know whether business is doing what we expected it to do? So, and then we ask the question, well, what do you expect will be the impact of all this investment? And again, we find consistency in advanced analytics has, will have the biggest impact. The Internet of Things will be next. Uh, I'm pointing to here, process technologies, machine learning, all of, so 3D printers, smart robots, those over the next three years. So this is now. So this data is talking about, I talked about some things that can happen way into the future as well as things. This is stuff right now, it's going on currently. Similarly for when we look at, at in, in specifically for APAC, what's, what are they doing? And the reason I'm doing that is oftentimes, if you called me on my mobile phone, which you're welcome to do by the way, um, but if you call me on my mobile phone at my house, I can't, you will know, get like, hello, and you'll say, who's the, ha, huh, is anybody, you know, that's because I live in a technology backwater you may have heard of, it's called Silicon Valley, and I don't have decent connectivity. I go to South Africa, I go to different places in Asia, I got great connectivity. Eastern Europe, same thing. <laughs> you know, it's like, wait a minute, <laughs> where am I? Yes. Can you define APAC for me? Yes. Yeah, so that that's uh, so that includes that's that doesn't include North America and South America. So it's Pacific Rim countries on you know the other side of the Pacific. Thank you for asking. Good question. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly my point. Yeah. <laughs> my point is is when when I but when I go to I remember just a couple of years ago when I was in in, uh, in Seoul I was looking around saying, Gosh, am I out of date? I got this clunky old phone, you know, and here's all these things people are paying with their phones and the like. Yes, ma'am. Um, so what do you mean when you say advanced analytics? Does that include neural networks? Yes, it does. Separate it out from the previous slide? Well, it's, yeah, so on the previous slide, uh, this one? This one. Oh, yeah, that, that's, so advanced analytics as a, as a category of things machine learning as a very specific analyst, because it also includes things like, you know, uh, reporting, business reporting, standard reports that you can get out of, out of a business, business intelligence tool, which, we, which, you know, we expect folks to just have. We don't, but nonetheless, it's still an area where investment is occurring. Um, and it's, the reason is that, of course, it's changing, and it's allow, the, they're allowing folks to do more on an individual basis, and I'll get to that point. Again, thank you for reminding me. Um, so are yeah. going to tell us what we mean by advanced analytics then? Yeah, then advanced, advanced analytics would include things such as machine learning is one of the biggest components, but it also includes, you know, neural networks, which are included in there. It would include simple regressions. It would include um, statistics of different kinds that have nothing, you know, with both forensics as well as predictive modeling. So you want to think of, all the different variations on you know, doing things that are fairly, a bit more advanced, all the way to um, when I was at Visa, we modeled, we modeled the uh, entire network of Visa using 
uh, using differential geometry. So, you know, so it includes that too. I mean, it's, it's a, a, a wide range of things. So, but, it, but in particular, it also includes fairly straightforward things that are easier to use, which is where the biggest piece of that market is right now. Um, we expect that to change, and I got a, an ask for this audience when, when, when I get further on to a little bit. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Going back, maybe the battery supply, or another, on that one's good enough, but the blockchain. Yeah. I know it has to be dangerous, but I, I read that that may be a solution to some of the security, cyber security issues. Is that yes or no? And if the answer is yes, why isn't that progressing? The biggest problem is too darn slow. So it's, it's so think, uh, you know, think, if you think of the internet um, a number of years back before Cisco and others created, you know, high, high performance switches, you know, stuff was just slow. You know, even if no matter whatever you did, it was, it, the IP was just slow. So we had to put it all into firmware to make it to make it go fast. The same thing is true on blockchain. It's just too slow the way it stands. More, moreover, it requires it requires because it's sending too many. It's sending a lot of different packets. There's a header and a footer. Those have to be parsed and understood until that stuff is into firmware so that it can, you know, run at a decent speed. It's going to it's going to be that's our biggest problem with it. The second the second thing is it's just it's fairly new. And using it in, in security situations, while its primary benefit would be for authentication, and I see that as having enormous benefit, but it needs work. So it's a, to, to us, it's a, yes, let's keep track of it. Yes, it's something to, to spend some time on, which is that level of investment typically means research it, you know? Um, so that's kind of, you know, we need help. This is an area that, that we need work. There's nothing, we know there's gonna be things that we can do. We know that there should be capability to master data, for instance, to understand customers better, to verify who they are. Uh, we know that there's, there's an, and we can disintermediate uh, a lot of current central systems that if they go down, cause serious problems that we could, we, that could be done theoretically with blockchain if we can get it going faster. Make sense? Okay. So I'm going to move on to this. Is Infonomics is, uh, is the topic. It's, it started with work with one of my guys, Doug Laney. Uh, Doug Laney, is, his research has been on how do I know the value of the data I have? And he, he started asking that question right after 9-11. And, and the reason being that when the, the towers went down, when Pentagon got hit, there was a lot of data loss. You know, they sh folks should have been backing up to a different site. They don't. They didn't. But at the same time, we know that it took a long time for some of those organizations to get themselves back up and running to anywhere near where they, they were before. That made Doug start to think about, well, that tells me that there was value there. You know, there was value in that data that they had. There was value in the algorithms that they used that somehow isn't recorded anywhere. And so he started looking at the accounting theory. What is, you know, what does GAP say? All the rest of it and what's, and came up with, it's time now to start thinking about the value of data itself and, and what is its potential value? What is its current va value? How do we book it? Do we book it? And the rest of it. So that's, that's an area of research that, that Doug talks about quite often as well as I wanted to introduce it here because it again, it's, it's an area we need to understand better because if we can understand the potency of data in terms of its ability to drive revenue, that will help us focus our investments. They'll help us focus our people. They will help us focus on where we need to go. So it's an important question and we know, we know this much about it and that is that those companies that, you know, using the Tobin's Q ratio, Doug, Doug did his research there, the regular companies to info-centric co companies, companies that really do understand that, that data has value, that they're mining that value and getting and, and using that and exploiting that value to do good things for people. We know that those guys you know, are two to three times, uh, actually four to five times, uh, higher, have a higher valuation. 
Why? Be, and you know, it relates back to that Hung La Hong slide on well, how does revenue break down under different circumstances? So that's an important. That's now this research needs to be extended and verified. You know, but and Doug has a book coming out in April in uh, August that uh, on titled Infonomics. So it's L A N E Y. I should have put up put it up there. Sorry about that. And its three components are really come down to. How do we mon you know, monetize information? How do we manage it? If we understand its value, we're going to manage it more carefully. We're not just going to let it throw go by the wayside. We'll also not do something dumb like I've seen done in too many companies, which is I'm going to master all of my data. Or I'm going to govern all of my data. Yeah, right. That's a waste of money. You know, there's an awful lot of data about you know, folks, cats and dogs that have nothing to do with our business that I know my guys have are sharing, which is fine. I don't have an issue with that. <laughs> the problem is, is I don't want to protect it. That's their problem. You know, it's their day to let them protect it. And it's, you know, it's we need to offer ways of doing that kind of thing. But by the same token, we got to understand when it's of significant value to an enterprise or an entire organization. When it's important to hold on to it because it's part of a key research that we're doing and we haven't yet gotten to conclusions on whether we're ready and when we're ready to release it. So understanding the data and its value and monetizing it correctly are, of course, key issues that we have to further understand as well. And I'm, the last two sections I've got are, you know, there's some of this stuff is scares people. Um, and, you know, when, when we surveyed, uh, this was work, this actually work done um, in 2014 that Frank Boutendijk talks about. And that's, that's that 56% of workers are concerned about the future. So, you know, there's, we're hearing that all over the world. We're not just hearing it in you know Europe and the US. We hear it in Asia. We hear it in, we hear it everywhere. Uh, folks are concerned because their education doesn't match what's needed. And we gotta, you know, we need to address that. We need ways of more creative ways of dealing with that so that folks aren't fearful of something, that they're embracing it and we're we're able to help them. Um, not in a paternalistic way, but rather offering those opportunities. Similarly, consumers, of course, are worried about, well, if I put all this data out there, aren't folks going to be listening in and understanding what I'm doing? Well, yeah. So. <laughs> Actually, I had this question when you yeah. first started talking. As we're moving the digital everything and towards singularity, yeah. is it uh, important for us as we're moving towards that to create a parachute or a hatch for people to opt out of being followed along if they want to engage in everyday society. Because if everything is digital and everything is moving towards singularity, how do you Good question. How do you become a citizen in that society when you don't want to? What should we do? <clears throat> do I have the answer? No, I don't. Um, but it's an important question. No, that is, that is precisely why we talk about this stuff. Um, because of the risks of doing it and not doing it and because and other barriers. But I want to get to let me let me come to that back to that in just a second, if I may, because there's OK, good. Thanks. <laughs> I appreciate that. So so, you know, we do have there are risks. Of course, there are risks that always, always, always risk. I. You know, I'm a mathematician, you flip a bit, you get, you know, I also study physics. You flip a bit, you get a different different signal, right? So you flip a bit on goodness, you got badness. You know, when I was doing fraud work at Visa, I was trying to figure out who are the bad guys. But, you know, to understand the bad guys, you got to understand the good guys. So you got to actually figure those things out. So, but there are always risks in this too. Risks of doing things for enterprises, for customers, for each other, there's risks of falling behind, not sharing, not doing, not do getting to where you need to be. Uh, so those risks have to be managed. But I think the one, and, and I had to put this up because I'm at a university, and every time we're at universities, we want to talk about, dang, folks, <laughs> we need people. Honest to gosh, I just spent six months trying to find one person that is a, you know, a machine learning specialist. I've got one, I need two. 
I got one in Europe, I need a second here. Six months of working on this, and we need more. And we need lots and lots more, but we also need capability to make it easier, right? To bring the lower, you know, there's educating more folks, but it's also about lowering the barrier to entry, right? So there's two things to do there. Um, well, there's money's always a problem for everybody. That's always true, as well as, you know, there are issues with respect to management and the like. Uh, and there are just, and there are not enough other folks that not understand data. That was, you know, another problem we have. I listened to one of my sons works at one of the Silicon Valley, you know, companies. It's fairly large. You know, they they cloud-based uh, operation. So they, you know, they're fairly modern in their ways. They have one data architect. One. And so guess what? If you need help, that person's got a list this long of other projects that they've got to work on. We need help on data. If we can't do the algorithm. I always tell folks, you know, my people I used to say, you know, I can't really do much with this data unless I got an algorithm to work on it. And if I don't have the data, the algorithm is just going to sit there. So we need both. And there are specialties. Handling huge volumes of data is not easy. There are risks involved. There, there is just you know, speed issues. There's storage issues. There's an enormous number of things. We need help with that. We also need help with how do we manage all this stuff? How do we, how do we deal with it and help the organization change and the like? And the last piece that I want to talk about is this one, which is, which is the fear side of this. And one of, the fierce, one of the fearful things is the one you mentioned, which is, do you opt in, do you opt out? What are the principles we apply? What we know are a lot of the questions at this point. We, have, we don't have the answers. Um, one of my folks studies just digital ethics, you know, and in particular says, well, I need to understand when something gets to the creepy line. You know, what does the creepy line mean? It means for different people, different things. For an established organization like, I don't know, uh, you know, a major international bank, creepy line is going to be fairly close in. Their, 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 their work is based on trust. They have to have the trust of the partners they're working with. If they don't have that, well, you've seen what happens in Wells Fargo's case. You lose that trust, you lose customers, you lose value, you lose your, ex fortunately, lost some of their executive staff, probably need to do more. So knowing, you know, what are the, so fear, fear is an important thing to understand. Fear drives behaviors in not necessarily productive ways. So if we can address the fear, we can get, pro we can make progress. Um, you know, when we get to this kind of thing, then, irrational things happen, and that's bad. Um, irrational things like, this is near, near my house where I grew up. So I grew up on the west side of Detroit. This is on the west side of Detroit. In fact, I, our first um, house home uh, for Janet and I back in Detroit was not too far from this place on Werner Ave. And this is, this is actually a very beautiful building. But it doesn't look so beautiful because it's got, you know, stones thrown at it, ceiling falling in. But what happened? You know, so people worked here. You can see there's just grass in the front. Those were the, actually were carriages and vehicles that could drive up. The, the things that happen when we go too far is one thing is displacing another. We're not keeping up. We're not paying attention. My city, which my hometown, Detroit, faced that. It was clear it was coming our way. We knew it was happening. Nothing got done. And we need to understand the sociological effects of this country because the disruption we're talking about is far greater than, you know, going from uh, ride share to, to automobiles to trains and the like. I mean, it's far greater than that. Um, and, you know, of course, there's, there's research about this. This is a bit dated. Um, one of my guys, I asked them to comment. He says, this is out of date. Why are you showing it at a university? Um, th th my, my point is really this, that there's, if, if this is even remotely correct, and, and I think in recent years we're seeing that productivity is actually declining, uh, significantly declined, and that's you know, from uh, Federal Reserve analyses, has significantly declined from IT, which was a driver for, for a number of years this period, of course, the effects come out about here. We make the investments here. You don't see it till later. 
um, and during this whole period, the dislocation. But it also is, think of it this way. This gap is jobs. That's people sitting homeless. That's people can't feed their families. That's people living in cars. That's, and I see, that, I see that in San Francisco. I see that down here. When I, when I walk around you know, Old Town, I see it all over the place. I see it in, in Europe now. I didn't used to. But I see it there, too. And it's, it's, we've got, you know, we who have the ability to understand and lead, we've got work to do. And then finally, that there is, you know, the transformation is not a one size fits all. This takes time, it takes energy. World Bank uh, has got their work in this area, is, I think, is useful and to understand what's happening, particularly in, um, in Sub Saharan Africa. And, and looking at what does it mean to build a vision? What does it mean to share that vision? What does it mean to share how we understand what we're doing so that folks can, you know, the kids can get smarter. They can, can start putting their skills to work. Those, that, those brains that are so valuable that we need working on some of these problems. The other part of the problem, of course, is that distribution of power has shifted. You know, and that's that's a big problem. And it's created all sorts of issues. I was just mentioned privacy. What is the right thing to do about privacy? These are these are big outfits now. They weren't they got big fast. Um, there's a lot to be done. Well, are they too big to fail? Probably not. Um, used to be said about General Motors, so goes General Motors, so goes the country. Well, we saw what happened there. So things do change. But I think the rate at which things are changing is so much faster that the dislocations can be even more serious. I think the other is that, so what do we do about it? We know that, we, we, just, we just know that we, we lost uh, FCC privacy rules, you know, thought maybe there's some value there, uh, whereas Europe is taking an, a different approach. You know, I work in a global company, I've always worked in global companies, sharing information is critical. Um, that, that, something not right, you know, what, what is the solution? You know, and I can only ask the question, I don't know the answer. You know, what is the right answer? Should people be able to opt out, as you said? You know, should, should entire organizations be able to opt out? Should countries be able to lock it down? You know, of course, that's going to happen whether we like it or not. But no, seriously, companies that do want to participate in the digital economy probably don't want to lock it down, but then they want to protect their citizens. They have fear, drives votes. What do they do? I don't, I'm, I don't know. Um, this is why we're here. We got to figure these things out. We know that there's, there's evidence such as these where individuals work with individual companies and got things changed. Um, so that's good, but that's also slow. It's also episodic. You know, we need to have we need to have a consistent understanding of what is the right set of steps. So the ethical the ethical parameters surrounding uh, the digital economy, digital business, digital digital society are, are enormous as well. So we've got to figure that out. So as I just kind of wrapping up, you know, when I think about digital, it, there's an enormous opportunity to build wealth. That's great. And you know, for folks like me who have been in this game for a while, who have done well with it, it's great for me. But I also know that my brother lost his job because he was in a declining business back in Detroit and he lost his house. And so I know what it means to be on both sides of that. So, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not fun. It's not easy. We got to figure it out on a family level. How do we help our families? How do we help our, our society, neighbors? How do we help each other? It's not something we can just do by ourselves. <clears throat> Uh, we have to invest. We got opportunities to investigate and to understand. Uh, there, but we got to do that now because this is happening right now. Right now, it's big. It's fast. It's happening now. We need lots of help. Everybody in here needs to help. Why? Because we do. <laughs> you know, because it's so complex. You know, it's going to take an awful lot of brain power to figure this out. Um, and you know, so in you know. But basically, stay on our feet, promote digital literacy, be ready to move into new opportunities, help folks find easier ways for folks to understand how to use data, how to use algorithms, how to combine the two to create value. Lots of things to be done there. We've, we've seen improvements, but we got a ways to go. 
Um, and don't think about, one of the things that drives uh, Frank Bautendyke nuts and several of my colleagues is, is this idea that there's such a thing as a best practice. If it was a best practice, it means it's out of date. That's the, the, so it's what, what are the practices we need to adopt and change to? Not the ones that worked last year. The ones that worked last year, they're fine. But what are the ones we need to do tomorrow or the next day? You know, those are the ones we want to, we want to do. So, what, so if we're from in the business area, we've got, we, we should be looking at business, and, and I recommend these things regularly to clients. You know, I, somebody's got to own it. I always think, you know, I've been in, like I said, commercial business. I need a single throat to choke. So, you know, that was me back at Visa. Uh, it really was. <laughs> you know, I was responsible to the board of directors. They said, Joe, we got $5 trillion running through this thing. Don't screw it up. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, that's a lot of money. And so we didn't, fortunately, we didn't screw it up. We made it better. We've got to increase productivity through automation, but we also have to find quicker ways to ret retain folks and retrain folks. So retain and retrain you know, has got to be something we think more about. Why? Because they're valuable. They know us, they care, they have families, they're going to, they, you know, we work with folks all the, regularly with each other, we got an opportunity to grow. <clears throat> we got to investigate the different power shifts. We have to understand what that means to us as business leaders. Uh, for in, in organizations like this one, we need to adjust curricula. We got to catch up. We're falling behind, we got two, we, I need people. Everybody I know needs people. Every place I go, whether it's a CIO, CEO, board, they need people. So train people, please. <laughs> you know, but we also need to encourage younger folks, men and women, to study math, to study stats, to study economics, to study business analytics. Understand this stuff and grow. And finally, we need research. We got, I, I just threw a lot of just, hey, got to work on these things. So that's it. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat>